album over that. Um, and uh, in the years since then, he has reinvented himself in various forms. I suppose most of you will know him as Sid Vicious, certainly, which was plastered all over the papers when it came out. He's also been a uh, Marat and a Tramp and a uh, happy father and, uh, and husband uh, in a, a mock uh, hello sheet. Um, the work he's going to be showing tonight, uh, he's got quite a few photographs from the uh, South London Gallery show, which unfortunately is just over, so if you've missed it, you've missed it. Um, uh, but I think he does want to talk about some earlier work as well, so um, I'd like you to welcome Gavin to the AA. Thing to do to start with an apology, but um, I always tend to do it as a way of sort of like getting over the first awkward bit of doing a talk, which is like I say, um, when Andrew asked me to do the talk, it was some time ago, and I thought, and uh, you know, sort it all out, resolve you know what I'm going to say, maybe even maybe even I'll write a paper and, and I'll sort of deliver a paper. Um, but of course, you know, the days go by and, you know, we get closer and closer and, and I kind of like start thinking, oh, mm, it's that thing I've got. Mm. <laughs> Last night, you know, I had to go out, you know, and stay up really late and sort of behave really miserably. And uh, today I had to work all day, you know, so suddenly like I'm here and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm on the tube. I'm thinking, right, now what is this thing? What am I, what am I here for? What am I, what am I going to do? What am I going to talk about? How am I going to, um, how am I going to sort of, play it. Um, and I kind of thought back to the original title that I'd, that I'd um, given Andrew, which was um, Me, Myself and I. And, um, and it was it was quite a flippant sort of suggestion for, for what a title for a lecture might be. But then I sort of thought, well, well why am I being asked to give a talk? Um, I mean, in theory, I communicate through um, through making sculptures, um, through making artworks. Um, I communicate, in effect, in a sort of non-talking way. Um, but having said that, of course, obviously the works or the things that I make don't possibly tell the whole story, or the story can be maybe brought to ground or, or brought uh, into a kind of light by um, the things that I say. Um, of course, the things that I say about my work aren't necessarily going to be the most accurate or the best things that you could say about the work that I make. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I just spoke to Mark very quickly outside and he was saying that, that, that the show that I did at the South London Gallery was kind of incredibly strangely um, uh, exposed in the press. There was kind of like very kind of, I think, quite poor press coverage of the show. Um, but I would say that, in a way, it's the job of the art critic, in effect, to, or, or, or I would say that there was a, there was a specialised job which would allow you to uh, talk about or think about art. Um, and then following that up as well, I would say that possibly artists are quite important people to listen to or to work with when you're trying to critique or understand what artworks are. Um, I mean, I'm always like a little bit kind of um, bugged out by the, bugged out by the, by in a way, like the problem of this sort of like academic situation, like me, I stand here with my bit of water and my microphone, sort of craning, or craning over the microphone like this, and you sort of sit there, um, kind of like expecting, waiting, thinking, mm, uh, possibly trying to sort of like think about what you know, what's happening now, where are we, you know, like what, what what's happening, you know, like looking at your watch, um, and. And I kind of think, well, you know, is this really the right... I've got some slides, you know, slides sort of like... Is, is actually like quite a dire kind of... Um, is a sort of dire representation of anyone's work? I mean, it's so... Possibly it's like a, a convention. We understand it as a sort of like a way that we could... Um, a way that we could not look at the work. We could sort of, we could sort of see the South London Gallery exhibition. Um, we're quite versed to looking through... 
uh, magazines and, and various forms of like photographic material and somehow coming up with a formulation or an idea about what an artist does or how they work or how they think even. Um, but quite a lot of what artists do does actually relate to and is specific to the actual being there at the time. I mean, I think that, that, that what, what I'm doing in my work, although I think that I'm critiquing the notion of signature, I am still batting on this really kind of like old, um, old sort of like hackneyed sort of house of the authentic or the original thing and almost like the sight of being somewhere, even if that somewhere is... is uh, is uh, ultimately challengeable from all sorts of directions. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, coming back to the me, myself, and I bit, and then sort of like thinking on the train, like like what I could say was I suddenly thought, well, I, ooh, I suddenly thought, well, it would be quite good if I could play that Della Soul record, me, myself, and I. That was a way of sort of like thinking back to like when I started using myself in my work um, when I was at the Royal College. And um, it was at a time when I was listening to lots of um, rap music and actually found that what was happening with this music was that, that um, the, the, the DJ was telling you like how fantastic they were, was, was advertising themselves um, and kind of was doing it under the sort of banner or, or also through a, a kind of political or a, um, a kind of academicized um, kind of format, a kind of, there was a kind of, um, there was a kind of platform upon which they were able just to advertise themselves. Um, and of course that platform was constructed through previous records. Actually what it was, was a situation where you took um, uh, records from the past, and namely records from a sort of, um, uh, not even or not necessarily a kind of a black route. Um, and then you remixed or resampled or, or reconfigured those tunes and then advertised yourself over the top of it. Um, and I started with a piece that was shown at the Saatchi Gallery, which was called a, a work called Title. And it was a signature that was signed across three, uh, three canvas panels. Um, the panels themselves were made from, um, they were made from recycled um, canvas that was strung onto uh, wood that was recycled um, and it was uh, uh, an envir basically it was an environmental painting. What I tried to do was take um, was take all the sort of environmental kind of sections, or take the energy flows that surrounded all the various steps that you might need to take in order to get to preparing a ground, um, and vet each one for its kind of uh, ecological or energy kind of uh, uh, cycle. Or um, I mean. As it transpired, of course, I drove all the way down to Eastbourne to pick up the recycled bit of canvas, you know. I sort of, like, I planted a tree to replace the tree that, that, that or the wood that I'd taken for the piece. I, I spent days, like, planing bits of wood down um, to, to, create the, uh, to create the stretcher. Um, there was no, there was no uh, glue in it or metal fixings. It was all just hemp that was sort of painst that the canvas was sort of painstakingly um, strung onto the... Uh, the stretcher, and then I painted with tree extract mixed with um, mixed with a sort of uh, a sort of again like a burnt black pigment. My signature in a very kind of um, uh, is it, it was a very kind of mannered way. It was it was it was nothing. It was it was it was no way fluid. It wasn't a kind of continual line. It wasn't. It didn't have a. It didn't have the the uh, the lightness of touch of a signature. It actually was something that was kind of quite heavily kind of um, it was like a sort of encaustic kind of decoration on the canvas. And then I sewed a hand sewed a panel um, in the corner, which had the ingredients of the work actually sewn into it and the various sort of procedures that I'd taken that I'd undertaken to to make the work. Um, I mean, one of the things about this piece that that seems so kind of um, curious to me as well is that of course people generally haven't had enough time to really read the, uh, the little kind of hand sewn panel and haven't actually had enough time to, to actually realise in a way what the painting was or how the painting functioned um, but they have had enough time just to sort of see Gavin Turk really big like across three panels um, 
And so sort of subsequently, possibly, you know, this is why I get to sort of stand up here and give some sort of talk about, you know, my work and how interesting it is. Um, should I? Uh, maybe I sort of like show my slides now. I, I can do it from here. Um, well, this is a sort of um, a little, this is actually like a real nostalgia trip for me in lots of ways. This was actually like one of the slides that I made for my, um, for my reassessment at the Royal College when I'd sort of like, I had to uh, resubmit because I hadn't, um, I'd not submitted enough work of the standard required. So I had to, um, I had to resubmit my, uh, I don't quite know what they expected me to do. They, they didn't provide any kind of space or studio or, or or any kind of uh, help with um, with setting up any work, with installing work, um, but they expected me to sort of, and as actually in their in their words, wheel in sculptures into an existing installation that I'd actually made. Um, anyway, one of the slides that I showed them, and it was part of me trying to explain like what my interests were at the time, was this slide, and um, and this was me sort of trying to sort of like. Get a, get a grasp on or, or trying to um, come to terms with a kind of nostalgic or with a kind of cultural baggage or with a, with a way of seeing that any production that I might undertake as an artist um, will, uh, will and it's, it's almost like it's, it's actually become almost more it's become more like this since the sort of creation of the YBA thing and the, the Young British Art sort of movement but I think at this sort of time I think this was like I must have taken this in 19, 1990 or not yeah 1991 um, it you know at this particular time maybe maybe we were coming up to it but there was sort of like we weren't really quite sure that that was going to happen but here here is here is like just something that I that I kept which is which is a cup of tea in a in a wax <coughs> plastic cup um, uh, published by the English Heritage, we've got a logo. We've got a logo of the the henge, um, and we've got the henge, which is you know our sort of in a way like our, our classic sort of heritage. Um, I might just. I mean, also the other thing, like me, myself, and I as well, and like this sort of thing about like talking about myself or talking about my work. Um, I'd love to, in a way, talk about something totally different. I mean, there is a point where I entered into this show at the South London Gallery, and it's got like something like eight or nine pictures of myself in there, and various signatures that I'd made. And I kind of thought, God, what is this space? I shouldn't be in here. Um, and um, and everyone, of course, smiled at me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this was a, this was um, <laughs> this was this is yeah a plaque which isn't a blue plaque. Funnily enough, but this is a plaque, um, John Ruskin, which, which, you know, he's kind of part of the reason why maybe the, the notion of the blue plaque was kind of developed. Um, he sort of like, in a way, develops a cultural climate, which, which might mean that, that it would be the right, that it would be sort of right, ugh, that it would be right and fitting for pale blue enameled plaques to be put up on the outside of buildings to remember um, various cultural. Um, whatever they're called, promoters. And this was my this was my plot. This is this is this was the sort of second phase of it. Um, I showed I showed the work like this in an exhibition in Denmark Street in 1993. Um, the the original piece. I think I've got. This is a slide of me in the studio standing underneath the. Um, um, Anyway, the, all I wanted to say about this, or what I say about this, yeah, because now almost like the talk's turning into sort of like normal Gavin Turk talk, which is could be problematic. I might have to change change tack. Um, but so what's happening here is this is called ca this is called relic, and then in brackets cave. Um, and what's happened here is that I've now found a Joseph Boyce vitrine that I can stick the... And this is a, this is a replica of um, an existing f uh, vitrine by Joseph Boyce um, that I can just stick the plaque into. But it just so happens that the... Um, that the let me do this. I just... This is... This thing. Like carrying microphone. Oh, carrying, I can sing the song. Um, that, this, that this slatted... 
uh, boarding, which is in the, um, the, the Boyce vitrine, is actually, um, is actually a sort of a simulation of uh, the, the boarding that exists did in the Royal College studio where I showed the original one. So there was a kind of, a te there was a kind of play with this sort of museum of mankind um, kind of ideal habitat for plaques um, kind of thing. Um, oh, um, I just, I just, yeah, I, I'll just, I'll just talk and it doesn't matter if it ne necessarily joins up or makes sense. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, maybe to point out the thing about the Joseph Boyce vitrine would be to say that not only was I able to sort of exercise um, my Museum of Mankind interest, but I was also able to make a frame w for the plaque, which in many senses, because it belonged to Joseph Boyce, um, the viewer maybe would say, oh, I know this, this vitrine, it belongs to Joseph Boyce, and subsequently remove it from their mind, i.e. Take the, take the vitrine and place it in the Joseph Boyce file, which would quite nicely mean that the plaque itself would, would be then floating within the, the uh, viewer's mind. Um, so floating in, floating in the middle of the uni... Oh, I, I, today, oh, I shouldn't talk about today. I just <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> um, this was the card that accompanied the, uh, the, uh, the, the Royal College exhibition. I'm going to go quickly. No, I've just turned it off. I've done the thing. No, no. It's good. So I started signing things. Um, me, myself, and I. Yeah, the, the, um, it seemed that. I mean, what I say to people, like, the people say, I mean, even my son said to me, why has your work always got you in it? Like that. I said, you cheeky thing. <laughs> No, I didn't. I said, um, I said, it's a very good comment, Curtis. Um, I said, um, I said, um, I, I said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of because uh, my experience of art has been, has been one of, um, I mean, you know, maybe my, maybe my work is a kind of comment on my experience of art, which is why I'm kind of a bit loath to kind of immediately click into the uh, sort of standard formats for, or the standard ways. I mean, at the end of the day, you'll sit here and you'll sort of attend a slide talk, and I'll stand here and I'll kind of give it the old wah, wah, wah. We'll see some slides, we'll go away, and we'll go, there we go, it's a start slide talk, you know, and it'll kind of, and it'll kind of work, you know. But, um... Uh, there is a point where, where we go around the, we go around the, the National Gallery or, or, or wherever it might be. We take the National Gallery because it's a kind of a nice a cliched sort of lot. And, um, and we, we see it in terms, of, in terms of signatures. We see it in terms of, um, in terms of uh, oh, who did this painting? Who did that painting? Oh, that's by so-and-so. We, we, sort of, we, we have to sort of understand what we're looking at in terms of, in terms of, um, in one part, cultural separations. We've got the Italian room, the Dutch room, the Spanish room, the, the, the Brits. We've got the different, we've got perhaps different historical periods. Um, and then we've also got, like, points where the, uh, you know, there's more famous works of this artist, less famous works of this artist. Um, and the way that that work is seen in terms of oeuvre, that actually that, that artists start to construct their own context within which um, we start to or attempt to uh, understand the things that they're making. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe my job now is to, tr is to sort of extend or try to uh, help um, elaborate on the context within which you may see my work. Um, but then there's also a point where, you know, I'm a bit loath to do it as well. But um, why? That's the question for later. I'll save that for later. Um, that, was, that, that piece was called Epiphany after um, Richard Hamilton's um, disc that says, Slip it to me. Um, This piece is a sort of, th this was actually in the Saatchi uh, 
gallery again with the, with the title painting. It was in the show in Denmark Street. Um, and it's something that kind of reappears now. I must say, I don't, I'm not sure I understand this work. <laughs> it was called, it started off being called Latent Logo. And, um, and I, what I was trying to do was I was trying to work with the, the, the chewing gum to develop a kind of wax seal or a kind of signature. I kind of wanted to extend the idea of the signature to the chewing gum so that, so that literally I could then sort of, you know, in the way that, I, in the way that maybe if you see a, a felt something or other, you attribute it to a Joseph Boyce moment, maybe you could see a bit of chewing gum and attribute it to Gavin Turk, um, which sort of seemed quite good. But um, anyway, it was called Latent Logo. Hang on, let's... No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to try and explain it, am I? I can't believe it. Um, and then I changed, and I decided I didn't like the title. And it, this was a, a sort of a radical, radical thing on my behalf, like because I'd always been told that you know you give something a title and that's it, the title sticks. But um, suddenly I thought, well, why? Well, why does it have to? It doesn't have to. Let's, I'll change it. Um, and so then I managed to get the Saatchi Gallery to sort of change things, the Saatchi collections, and I got them to sort of change all their records. But it, it still didn't quite work, because occasionally I see the original title sort of float in. So you have to be a little bit careful um, about changing titles to your work. But this did become, in the end, it became Floater. Um, I don't think that's actually an improvement. I think it's just a <laughs> sideways move. Um, Maybe because it was a maybe it was because I thought it was a slightly dead idea. I don't know. It it is, by the way. Maybe no one actually knows what it is. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's quite difficult to see. It's a it's a glass vitrine um, with one, two, three, four, five bits of chewing gum stuck on the ceiling that's stuck on the roof of it, um, and that's basically how it, how it functions. Um, this I'll talk very quickly about was a miniature walking stick. The top of the stick is made of a silver cast of a bit of chewing gum. Um, some of these slides I, I, I don't quite know why I've put in, but anyway. This was a performance that I did. Um, this must have been 1992. Um, which, which I never, again, it hasn't been quite resolved as a piece of work. I, there was a, there was a, I did have some conversations with people about putting this structure up in here at one point. <laughs> Not this room next door. Um, and I kind of thought, oh, that's good, you know, it'll be like the real thing, it'll be like, like architecture or something. What it was, was a, with a stage that, that, um, that was made w w in, I collaborated with an architect, Ali Rashid, and, um, we, we sort of together like designed this stage, which I then and with the help of with the help of these um, names that appear across the top of the uh, screen here, um, I performed a kind of uh, almost ritualized performance where the people who who had sponsored me, which are the names there, came up and were photographed with me on the said night, the night out with Gavin Turk, um, on this sort of uh, on this sort of, in a way, like art um, float. Um, I was like um, a new sort of uh, beauty product or uh, some car on the boat show. It was like a kind of um, fair. Uh, is that right? Fair? Some sort of fair. Vanity fair. There's people, and it, it was sort of like good old, in fact, it looks like someone's been drinking beer on the slide as well people drinking beer, this was on the night, and this is what people did, basically they listened to sort of like 80s tunes and drank beer. Some more people drinking beer. Michael Corris, smiling. Um, hmm. A page from a Yves Klein uh, catalogue with, with uh, rather lamely painted Union Jacks in oil paint over the top the page put on its side, reframed, two untitled triple chromes, 1994. This is um, a larger painting, indoor flag. The blue sections of the flag are painted with international climb blue, a patented blue pigment color. Gavin Turk, right hand and forearm. 
um, slide glasses. This is a response. I was sort of thinking about the way that, uh, that, that um, the last time I showed this slide, it, it, I, I was talking about the way that you, the way that you construct practice, and um, I, I suddenly found myself being quite. I found myself almost talking about the way that, as an artist, you sort of you trip and stumble and fall through a career. Um, it's not just a simple case of sitting in a studio, um, developing works, and those works sort of like leaving your studio, going into um, the the gallery, um, what happens is that there is a sort of continual sort of like nagging attention from the outside world and there is your sort of like attempt to get back into your studio which you never actually do and what happens is that people ask you to do things. Um, in this case someone said we've got to do the magazine, we've got to do this thing now, it's time, it's time, give me your slides. So then I sort of like, you know, like whatever it was, like four days later of course, you know, didn't really have four days later but I've done this, I've made this photograph, you know. So it was a photograph of, kind of, in a way, this demand for give me your slides. Um. There he is. I've got another one now as well. I've got a little girl as well. He's much bigger. He's four and a half now. Curtis. And, um... M Deborah, Deborah, my girlfriend's been um, been called Isabella Rossellini as well after this, which she thinks is kind of okay as well. It's hand painted. This is all really hand. This is all hand painted. All the typeface is like quite obviously when you see the work. I mean, maybe in this slide it's not so easy to see, but when you see the work, it's quite obviously hand painted, and um, that was a sort of response to um, this uh, Ceci Nespar and Peep, the painted. Uh, text. I had this sort of. I was running through this idea of um, uh, how uh, painted text was a sort of picture of text, and in terms of a picture of text, it was almost like uh, lived in a different kind of reality space to text itself. Anyway, anyway, what happens in Hello Magazine, of course, is that um, is that you build a career as an artist, and then um, and then basically. Um, you become so celebrated and so and so desirable socially that people actually aren't really interested in your art at all. What they want to do is they want to get into your house and see what kind of dogs you've got. Um. Uh, mm. I don't. I don't talk about it. The camouflage self-portrait that was cool, but it. it I've, I've sort of mucked it about. I've taken it off the front of a cover. This is um, this is kind of um, this was a piece that was in the South London Gallery exhibition. I think we m we're almost there. Hmm. I'll just talk briefly about this. This is sort of um, it's kind of a museum, a museum, a monument in a way. It's um, it's Gavin Turk's nine-inch roller, and um. It's it's kind of a copy of another roller that I made before, which was um, which was a roller that had dried out in the tr in the paint tray, that I then painted and patinated so it looked like bronze. It was a kind of um, reverse action uh, Jasper Johns work, and um, now with this, I've actually then now actually had the roller itself cast into bronze so it's almost like a sort of a lame uh, version or a, a kind of uh, extended tribute to the tribute uh, bleh, bleh. Um, this is a piece that was that was at the um, this was it when it, it just it was just being removed from a show called fuck off in um, in Underwood Street bank um, it's called Pimp, and then it went on to, to this kind of jazzy, sort of slick home. Um, this was a, actually like a bit of a coup, really, because suddenly like this work appeared in an exhibition um, that Greg Hilty and Michael Archer curated, like I uh, Material Culture, it was called, at the Hayward Gallery. And um, it happens to be quite fortunately parked just in front of, like on the, other, on the reverse side, there is a, um, a bit of... A Tony Cragg uh, sculpture with with bits of kind of coloured plastic that range sort of across the floor, 
Um, and there did seem to be this sort of affinity with these junky bits of like rainbow plastic disappearing across the floor and the, um, and the sort of shiny home for them, maybe. Um, I don't, I mean, again, like the, the work was, the work was a, was a, I mean, maybe people know the work, maybe people have seen the work. It's always very difficult as well, like when you talk about your work to actually know uh, like how detailed you should be or how, how, um, how kind of uh, communicative you should be. But anyway, that, I think that's, that's my problem, not yours. Um, this actually was, um, this is a sort of ongoing problem, this work. It, um, it's, it's, the work is called Font, and um, it's, it's a kind of, t it's a toilet profile that's taken around 360 degrees, and it, it kind of, I first had the idea for doing it in about like 1989, and, um, and it took me until 1994 to kind of make two. Um, since then, one of them has broken. Um, I had this sort of like idea when I made the work that it was going to be the the last work that um, that the museum that the museum of contemporary art, like a museum of contemporary art, i.e., sort of uh, national art collections, would buy for their collection. That that somehow like there was it, that it was a sort of full stop. Um, the I mean, I think in my mind, what I thought of when when I when I came up with it was I actually like I actually quite I mean, maybe it is very banal, but I I thought of Duchamp's um, I, I sort of like went from Duchamp's fountain sculpture um, and I ran through my mind to the best of my knowledge all the object sculptures I'd ever sort of come across and seen in my life um, through my mind as quickly as I could. Um, and sort of ended up with that, like that we hadn't really gone that far away from the original sculpture. But somehow, like then, you know, we'd actually like in the journey we'd drawn in and, and almost like run into a bit of kind of um, a bit of classicism, actually, a bit of kind of um, a bit of uh, yeah, a bit of the old school. And um, it's got this wibbly signature. It's a it's an enameled ceramic. It's a ceramic uh, pot. And it, and it has a hole that goes all the way through it. Um, here is, um, is a thing that you can't read, but it says uh, Galleria d'Arte Moderna Roma. I think that's the one. I don't know. I can't remember which one was in the show, but I think it's that one. Each of the bases has, has a kind of, uh, has a name on it, has a, has a sort of plaque or a badge. Um, the idea was that these were the sort of destinations um, for the sculptures, that, the, that somehow the sculptures were addressed to... Um, to their or for their uh, particular museums, as if as if uh, you could uh, take this sculpture anywhere, and it would seem almost like it had come from where the label said it had come. Michael, just, just saw you there. So from from the this isn't stand-up comedy, but. Um, so from, from fonts or sort of egg cup looking things to something that was called Godot, it's, a photo, it's actually just a photograph. It's me wearing a mask. Um, it's taken in Richmond Park and um, it's a Magritte uh, style photographic work um, using sort of various obvious kind of in your face uh, devices for I hope and what I what I hoped I hoped um, s for creating um, a psychological kind of environment the, the there's a small patch of water there's a square sort of tree there are sort of I didn't in my original plan I didn't think of a square tree I thought of just a circular tree it just happened that it was a square tree that's a that's a fortunate uh, accident um, that uh, that you've got this sort of bank of trees. There's no. Uh, w we went one morning and took the photographs, and um, and then when we got back, there was loads of birds and sort of things flying around on the water, and that seemed to somehow ruin the picture. So we had to take it again. It's taken in first light, so the light is very um, kind of like unreadable. Um, 
Anyway, maybe it's I, maybe it doesn't need too much talking about this piece. Um, the the mask then became this work here, and it, it's a shame that I I mean again like probably everyone knows the um, everyone knows the the Manzoni uh, pieces that were shown at the Serpentine, but the, there's a, there's a series of works he did. Um, where, which came from a performance where he, he, he made uh, people in the, in the gallery eat, um, eat eggs that he'd put his thumbprint on. Um, and then after that, they were kind of preserved in these kind of curious boxes. This, of course, is, over, is an oversized box, and it's a box containing the mask that I wore in, the, um, in Richmond Park. Um, and in a way, possibly then, sort of describes a head... Uh, in a box or a head with with a frame around it, and maybe has and uh, maybe kind of uh, maybe associates itself with a sort of closed form or image that I think is in the is in the broadsheet. Is that right? The, the photograph of my head with my eyes closed, yes. which maybe people know as well. Um, so this is actually an installation shot of an exhibition that 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 Andrew was talking about before that I did at the South London Gallery. It was called the Stuff Show. Um, and um, and when people ask me about it, I kind of I'm, I'm sort of slightly embarrassed about it because they sort of say, "Well, what did you have in it? What work did you have in it?" And I sort of say, "Well, it's good, sort of like good old-fashioned modern art, you know, because because in a way, like there's, I mean, there is a piece that plugs into the wall, but um, but generally, it's you know, it's stuff that really does refer to the muse museological sort of investigations it's stuff, stuff that does actually sort of like fit in frames it, it does sort of generally plays like quite a quite a straightforward game i think that maybe the, the there's a slightly subversive thing going on up, up in the top of the of the thing maybe i need a sort of like two oversized chewing gums which possibly put you back to the floater that actually now of course you're in the vacant uh, vitrine case with these things stuck sort of onto the wall now possibly um, uh, and maybe they are the, they are the sort of cheeky um, slightly site specific um, interventions that are going on there was another cheeky site specific intervention that went on which is that I wrapped all the work up for the private view now of course I think it just ended up like pissing off about 2,000 of my friends but, um, but, but, but it was a good thing really because all the people that actually managed to travel back down to the South, Gallery, South London Gallery and it's not exactly round the corner it's probably not well, it's round the corner from a few people but not round the corner from everyone um, all the people that did travel back, of course, like, said that they, you know, they understood why, why it happened, why things were wrapped up. I mean, I think that, to be honest, it is a very sort of juvenile thing to do. And, and I think everyone's been looking for kind of, you know, very kind of rational, formulated kind of, oh, uh, well, it was a reference to Christo, it was a reference to um, this, that, and the other. I mean, I think, actually, it was a much more kind of, it was a much more... I think, yeah, I think it's fairly true to say it was quite a juvenile thing to do. But it was about trying to push a point. Um, and, and that point was similar to the Hello magazine, that there is a point where, where overemphasis or an over-excitement or engagement with art actually, of course, brings about a total dissipation and a, and a place where you, you never get to see anything in the end. Um, and, it, and it also then, as well, did refer to the... Um, the way that, um, that that I have found myself behaving, and almost like not in a particularly not in a particularly conscious way, where I went to this is the closed it, this is called portrait of something that I'll never really see. I mean, a, a kind of uh, it's a silly title again, but it sort of the idea was you know that 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 I wouldn't see myself with my eyes closed, which. Anyway, it, it, I, I, wanted a, I wanted a kind of very sort of deft, sort of deft, is that the right word? I don't know. I wanted a very closed, um, uh, close portrait which, which confused the, it, in a way it confused the possibility of the engagement of the person being portrayed as that person being portrayed. What am I talking about? I've lost myself. Man, I'm just floating in lost space here we have 
a, f a self-portrait of the artist. The artist can't actually see what he's doing. Anyway, I just thought that it challenged its own construction, you know. There was, a, there was a pause then. Everyone <gasps> held their breath. It wasn't just me. Um, I, I've, I've lost some slides that I wanted to show, actually. Because I wanted... To, uh, I was going... We just hang on to the private view thing, will you? Thank you. This is... Um, I, I don't want to talk about this piece too much anyway, but this is a piece that was in the show. This is now large uh, signature works. This is called 1,000... It's got 1,234 eggs. Um, I mean, there is actually more or less 1,234 eggs. Um, the signature is cut with a scalpel into the eggs. Um, I should have shown the, this slide before that one because it's the piece I made before. This actually is very difficult to read, but what it is, it's a... Um, and in the exhibition, it was fray it, these, these works have become framed. This is it out of its frame and slightly sort of wonky and not very readable. It says, Gavin Turk, um, in, in polystyrene beads, uh, double height where the signature is. Um, and this work's called Constellation. And um, it... <coughs> anyway, sort of stellar thing. Uh, Manzoni. Uh, reference. Um, oh, I didn't want to show you that one. I wanted to show the egg one off. Yes. So really, I should have showed it that way around, like the, the polystyrene one, because then I made this one. This one, in effect, is is a more complicated piece for me. Um, what I attempted to try and do originally was to make a sort of macroscopic version of the other one. Um, but in the end, what happened, I think, was that um, I filled up this uh, is seven foot by five foot canvas with eggs. And I uh, realised that if I was actually going to sign my name in double height eggs, um, I'd need you know another 15 <laughs> canvases like this. And I thought you know the, the chicken population of, of, of the world like, doesn't need this, doesn't need me doing this anyway. So so I stopped after doing this after fish after panelling in the canvas. I then stopped. I had a panel of I had a panel of white eggs, um, and. Uh, it was almost by accident that uh, then I found myself like actually carving or cutting um, my signature, like like uh, in a way removing my signature from the work, or using a process of removal to make the signature, and that kind of negation as well, like becoming more obvious, like when the line became fatter, the less signature you saw like with the dot on the eye which is up there, more light gets inside the egg and, and subsequently like the line becomes fainter, becomes less obvious. Um, this, is, this is the conversation that I was kind of bark, bark, bark about the private view, which is, um, which is I mean, again, I was, I'm slightly... Uh, unclear as to whether I should have like a waxwork and a uh, and photographic work within the same exhibition. Maybe there is a maybe there is a sort of curatorial sort of problem with that. But um, it seemed to work sort of almost like more formally or s aesthetically to have um, to have uh, photographs and the sculpture in. But the the clothes that I'm wearing, this 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 character that 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 I've sort of like found here, was found from um, something that I did, um, which which when I did it, I didn't think of myself as doing anything that was to do with art. It was something to do with dressing up and going out. Um, and that was that I went to the sensation opening, which was billed as and possibly was um, the sort of YBA or the kind of like. Uh, high point of the um, the sort of the young British art phenomena um, situation and and I kind of I think I was trying to um, I think I was trying to deal with some sense of alienation um, again maybe maybe kind of incredibly naive maybe incredibly sort of uh, kind of juvenile but anyway I went as this kind of character and later on in my studio I then sort of found myself thinking hey that character might be okay as a as you know as one of Gavin Turk's artworks 
So, so then I kind of refound the character from this thing that I'd done. Um, and it, and it was, there was quite a lot of time lapse. And I had no intention of making this, this piece um, at, at the time of doing the, perf at the performance, the, at the time of dressing up in this way. Um, and, and then I suddenly like, thought, yeah, OK, let's do it. So then it did actually lead me to um, initially taking a series of photographs. I took um, one of the reasons why it became this sort of this strange like from all sides and, uh, and this has sort of worried me a bit because it seems like so obvious or it seems to have such a logic about it um, you might say where's the back where's the back view you know in a way if you want a sort of like pack of cards but um, it, one of the things about this was that I knew at this point what I was trying to do was set up um, was set up a kind of um, an initial image. The idea was that this was a work that was shown before, so that there was a sort of a precedent that I then could take the waxwork sculpture from. In the way that prior to this, when I made a sculpture pop, the the, um, the Sid Vicious one, I was able to use Warhol's um, Warhol's picture of of Elvis as as a sort of means of composition. Um, so I kind of wondered whether it was possible to take a series of photographs that could not only like uh, uh, that could not only help me to make the sculpture, i.e., enable me to have still photographs hanging around of me, you know, um, in the way that I need to see myself in order to make myself, as it were, ich um, mach mich. That um, that that I was also able to kind of set up a source that I was able to try but I don't know if it I don't know if it does that but the attempt was to try and set up a source so here's this is those the photographs are called oi exclamation mark the exclamation mark is quite nice because it looks a little bit like the eye sort of upside down um, and this the sculpture is called bum bum as well as like um, a term that, that the Americans use um, for someone that sort of lives on the street, and another word that they might use is sort of is punk as well, and um, and then punk sort of related back to Sid, and uh, and then Sid was actually like being uh, Frank Sinatra when he was dressed up in this kind of outfit. So then he related back to America. It was a sort of there's a kind of um, Anglo-American thing going on, and I'm not entirely sure um, how it's working. It's, Bum is actually trying to remember, in a funny sort of way, he's trying to express uh, some, of the, some of the things that... Um, he's trying to remember Pop as well. I mean, the, 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 the pointing hand is where the gun once was. The hand that was poised like to get the other gun out has now sort of like drooped down. The, the kind of, the sort of sn snarl has now become a bit of a slur, um, and he's sort of slightly kind of, like, kind of got crappy pants on or something. He's, just, he's like a bit... You know, bleh. Um, I don't. The other, the annoying thing is that I haven't got any slides of the Marat piece, which I did want to show. But I've got a large uh, transparency of it, which which we haven't bought now. But I was think, yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Never mind. Um, Compositionally, within the show, it, the, the sculpture worked quite well because it forced people to actually go right round. It forced people to actually traverse around the space in a certain kind of way. The South London Gallery is, is one whole big large room and in, in many senses works as a kind of... Um, it works as a sort of set piece, like somehow you can sit in the middle and engage with the whole room and what's going on inside it. So it's actually very difficult to negotiate that space um, if you want to make several pieces of work. And um, one of the things that this work did do rather nicely was it meant that you actually had to come right, right up and go round the outside of it, um, well, if you wanted to see what the face of the figure was, which I think is, is quite important in terms of the process of waxworks and recognition and the face in terms of recognition and the face then relating back to um, the idea of the portrait. Um, I didn't actually talk about like why, again, I've, I sort of like forgot the me, myself, and I bit again. Sort of, then Curtis's question, was I going to, did I, I didn't, did I? No, never mind. I think I might have, I might almost be running out. I think maybe, I oh, know. The chewing gums. PK1. PK2.
Bubba Elvis. I think that that is the last slide I've got. Um, hmm. 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 Um, maybe you turn the lights on. Or, you know, I don't know. Just, yeah. I don't know. How did, what's the time? How are we doing? Oh, we've got, got ten minutes. <laughs> um, Does anyone want to do questions? No. Um, Curtis, is, <laughs> Curtis is really a uh, perceptive question. Um, well, uh, yeah, I kind of answered it. I think I've been trying to answer it all the time. Maybe I'm just always trying to answer that question. Um, I think that when I was... Uh, I think that there was a time when I was trying to involve... Uh, other people within my within my practice, where I was trying to take photographs of other people, where I was actually trying to stereotype or or use other people to um, express my ideas, and actually found it very difficult to take responsibility for that kind of use of someone else's identity or use of someone else's kind of um, character or looks even. Um, to express my ideas and I sort of like there was a point where I think that I found it only fair possibly to use um, myself but there was also that point of and it, and it does relate back to this sort of sense of, of this continual experience of, of kind of um, finding things that you had all around you all the time but almost like finding them within a kind of cleared out space like, like almost like hey, hang on a minute, I've got a ready-made here. It's actually called, like, you know, myself. Hang on a minute, I've got, you know, a name. Hey, I can, u you know, I can use that. It's like, almost like this attempt to try and sort of like, um, sort of like, refine myself or, or to, um, to catch myself um, outside of myself or to be able to go into my studio and sort of like take bits of my life to sort of like use them um, in terms of uh, a way of trying to uh, express or to try yeah, what am I talking about <laughs> trying to <laughs> hit the target Photographs, the photographs of the bum, like, are kind of consistent with those sort of photographs of Native American Indians, where you take the Indian out of context and you put him in a white scoop. Um, I mean, they are incredibly harsh. They are, they are sort of, they are sort of medical the way that they work. And, and in that sense, yes, they are much more voyeuristic. And, uh, and as you say, like, they're much more problematic. That the, that the man might be like in this, like the man in his sort of in his state. Um, might end up in this sort of vacuum, as it were, kind of like abandoned by, abandoned actually by the, the things that made him sort of, in a way, abandoned by the greyness that makes sense of the way that he looks, in a way. Could, well, of course, this was the idea, but in the end, then I had to, of course, like get some smaller photographs made, because like the idea of like clay everywhere and the, every, the photographs get absolutely trashed. So in the end, of course, I, I wasn't actually able to use the actual photographs as well. Um, but again, I mean, possibly this is just that thing about the way that you sort of like trip and stumble through, um, through kind of various ideas about things. I mean, you know, that's how it is. I think. So I don't know. If, is that an answer? Sort of an answer. Just a, maybe just a. I'm just curious when you say using yourself as the as the as the kind of ready made for the for the artwork. In some ways it seems like perhaps it's not so much yourself as a persona of yourself. In a way that the works as they develop and over the years as they develop, you, you kind of create a persona of the artist Gavin Turk, who's not the person who's standing here, in a way. I mean, 
No, but there's a, the, now the person that's standing here is, get, is, is, is getting better at standing here and probably is, getting, is probably getting closer to the monster that he's... It gets more and more difficult to... As you kind of get, as you get better at it, maybe there is this sense that you can exploit um, this sort of the, the, the moment or the, the, the process. But there is a... I think there is a... I mean, I do have a, a, ch a signature that I use in my checkbook which is not the same as the signature that I use on my artwork. I don't have any checks.
and you know, the possibly is this sort of photonic white, sort of white working in white space. Um, in a way, like the reflection of, the, in a way, like the reflection of the gallery wall, like a white emulsion canvas on the white emulsion wall. Um, and and so, so I've been working on that sort of work for quite a long time, and that was influencing ways that I was making decisions. So, so possibly when I went to sensation, even though I wasn't doing something that was art, you know, I was aware that that I was going in a not in a black overcoat. I was going in a pale down. I was being pale. I was being sort of a grey character rather than a black character. Um, and then suddenly, of course, like in the context of white pictures, suddenly we had a kind of muted tone. So the colours were all kind of like really kept down. But almost like because there was a control of colours that it seemed to sort of like you seem to become aware of colour within the work. That's, that's what but I think the white on white has to do with a kind of purity of transcendence. What you were doing seemed to work against seemed that. Seemed to work against that. Well, um, um, dirt of death. Dirt of death. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that um, there is a there is a point where where um, there's certainly a strong set. I think there is certainly a strong sort of like subjective sense there in the, with the work. I mean, it's made in sort of like subjective place as well as I mean, hopefully as well as. Within that subjective place, there probably is a kind of, um, probably is a sort of relationship to that, uh, the break, you know, the kind of breakdown of, of yourself, the break, the breakdown, the breaking down of yourself, um, the the in a way the kind of the the process towards sort of ruin or something. I'm just like ruination. The modernism of the white cube, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's, it's a, you're using something. It's in it, yeah, that, um, yeah. I mean, it, it is that kind of curious. There is a sort of curious end game in the thing um, that's then being played in such a kind of light and hot, you know, such a kind of like sweet way that it's like you can't quite. I mean, it, I, I don't really know quite how to. I mean, I would still say that my work was sort of changing, and I was still sort of. I mean, I feel like not so long out of college, and I feel that that that. I still haven't quite learned how to how to know how to get work to work. I mean, quite, I think that there was a small feeling, and, it, and the last exhibition that I did, which was in Cologne, there was a large feeling of the work actually cancelling each other out. Like the work actually was attempting to do very different things, but in the end, what it did was it actually like was it challenged itself so much that it almost like neutralised itself. And there was, in a sense, like a little bit of that going on. With the way that the chewing gum possibly challenges the whole kind of like the whole idea of putting the other work in its face, that that maybe some of the, the figures challenge the photograph, that the that sort of maybe some of the signatures are challenged by you know the a sort of a, a sort of corner that had some little sort of studies paint sort of stuff, sort of flaky paint, um, and and the shop which was a which was a rack of postcards all the same. Which Production of this postcard with my face stuck on the Union Jack. I mean, that was the shop. The postcards were 10 quid each. Uh, I mean, there are some, you know, <coughs> there's a point where I, I, of course, I'm very interested in going, you know, in going everywhere, doing everything, you know, in, in, in being as, as kind of flexible and open with my work. But there's also a point where that flexibility has its. Um,
use my signature um, on every word that's got my signature, it's a different one. So in a way, although there's a attempt to try and like be critical of the signature, the signature in a way is kind of authentic. I.e., it only applies to that. I mean, you know, in my studio, I've got photocopies of all the sort of various signatures for the various different signature pieces. Just to imagine next week, uh, Gerber's Muth is, uh, is talking at the same time, same place. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank Gavin for coming on this evening.